Welcome to Speak Up and Stay Alive Radio with author, speaker, and your host, Pat Rulo. Finally, someone willing and able to blow the top off hidden healthcare and hospital dangers. She's provocative, upbeat, balanced, fearless, fresh. Pat has over 20 years of experience as a professional public speaker and knows how to approach this important subject with enough humor and wit to keep you informed, entertained, and empowered. Each week you will say, oh, as Pat explores and exposes little-known hospital hazards, delves into the deep waters of dangerous healthcare practices, picks the brains of her good-looking and influential guests to help keep you and your family safe in today's fragmented healthcare system. The program is not intended to replace medical advice from a licensed professional, but rather to encourage you to become a well-informed participant in your health and well-being. And now, your host, Pat Rulo. Hello, I am Pat Rulo, and I will be your hostess, your one-stop patient safety radio hostess, where I will spend the next hour serving you a generous helping of everything you need to know to help you and your loved ones stay safe during any doctor or hospital visit. People ask, who are you? Who am I? I am you. I am every person who has ever been in a hospital or doctor's office and has received less than acceptable treatment. I am you, the person who got an infection during a simple outpatient procedure. I am you, the patient whose questions are ignored, who struggles to speak to the doctor as he or she has one foot out the door. I am the missed heart attack, the hospital-acquired infection, the wrong diagnosis, the unanswered call button. I want this patient safety show to be about you, your family, your friends, and your loved ones. Speak up and stay alive, radio. Yes, that's O-H with an exclamation point. It will cause you to say, oh, as each week we delve into little known hospital and healthcare dangers. When you understand why something happens, you are better equipped to do something to change it and prevent it from happening to you. If enough people begin to speak up together, each of us can alter the current precarious path of today's unsafe healthcare practices. Well, today is August. What happened to summer? Why does it pass so quickly? Quite like life, I guess. That's why we must do everything we can to enjoy every moment and to do meaningful and purposeful things with each and every moment. And our special guest today is one of those people who had the similar view of a shortened season, life, who used it to create a very purposeful healthcare delivery model that is now used in many hospitals and healthcare facilities around the world. You've picked a good day to tune in, so sit back, kick off those flip-flops, grab your coffee or tea, perhaps iced, and enjoy this next very special and meaningful hour with us. But for now, it's time for the healthcare hazard of the week. Things are seldom what they seem. Be prepared! Things are seldom what they seem. Skim milk masquerades as cream. Politicians verbalize, but their words are mostly lies. So they be frequently. I've always liked that song. It's from Gilbert and Sullivan, the HMS Pinafore. Things are seldom what they seem. What am I talking about? Well, I didn't plan to talk about this, but I am so incensed that I have to share it with you. This past weekend, I found a door hanger sitting on my front porch. No, not securely hung on the doorknob as a normal door hanger should, but rather on the front porch floor, perhaps in uh, hopes that it might blow away. Anyway, it said in big, bold letters, good news. Now let me stop right there. Anything unsolicited that starts with good news is generally not simply a marketing ploy to those stupid enough to think that if it says good news, well, then it must be. The flyer was from the Illuminating Company, our electric service provider, and it said, you have been selected to receive a new digital smart meter as part of a pilot program in the Cleveland area. What, me? I've been selected? Hooray! Honey, grab the champagne and two glasses. We're winners! Actually, what I said was less polite than that, 
And it ended with, honey, grab the champagne and two glasses and let's enjoy life before we're irradiated to death by our new smart meter. Now, if you don't know about smart meters, you must listen to the rest of what I have to say. They are a health hazard, period. In addition, they are a violation of my and your human rights. So let's go. From a source, stopsmartmeters.org. What is a smart meter? Well, smart meters are digital utility meters. You know, the meter attached to your house that is read each month by the utility guy or gal. But now the smart meter does not have to be read. Instead, it sends your detailed usage information to the utility using a radio frequency transmitter. The meter also contains other capabilities, such as a remote shutoff. Yes, that means that your power can be turned off remotely. They are a part of a bigger plan to change the electricity grid to a smart grid. Smart meter planning in the United States is related to the Energy Act of 2005 and administered by the U.S. Department of Energy, the FCC, and each state's public utility commissions. However, in that act, there was no mandate to force all residential consumers to accept installation of the smart meters, only that they would be offered. The federal government also supports smart grid and, for example, in the state of Ohio, in August of 2009, $1.2 million in federal stimulus money was awarded to the state, and an additional $204 million was awarded to Duke Energy, Ohio. AEP Ohio received $75 million to demonstrate a secure, interoperable, and integrated smart grid regional demonstration program. All right, so now we have a handle on what's really going on here, right? All right, so how do you know if you have a smart meter or not? You can go outside and look. Your old electric meters have five small clock-like dials and a glass casing, which allows you to see the spinning dials inside. A smart meters have digital displays and plastic casings, which you cannot see into. Recent smart meters often have the word smart on the front, but just because it doesn't have that doesn't guarantee that it's not transmitting. Now, here's the million-dollar question. Can a smart meter be harmful to your health, or can it be unsafe? Here's a story. Wireless smart meters emit radio frequency microwave radiation called RF similar to that used by cell phones and Wi-Fi routers. The transmissions from smart meters occur day and night and are not directly related to your household usage and will send real-time information to the utility company every 15 minutes or more often. This radio frequency is part of the range of frequencies recently placed in the category possible human carcinogen by the World Health Organization in May 2011, meaning that it may cause cancer. Public health professionals and scientists have been concerned about human exposure to this type of low-level radiation for some time now. In fact, you may have read about ways to reduce your exposure to these radio frequencies from your cell phone. But unlike a cell phone, you have no control over your smart meter. There is no off switch, nor can you move it to a different location in your home. For over 50 years, the American Academy of Environmental Medicine has been studying and treating the effects of the environment on human health. In the last 20 years, their physicians had been seeing patients who reported that electric power lines, televisions, and other electrical devices caused a wide variety of symptoms. By the mid-1990s, it became clear that patients were adversely affected by electromagnetic fields and becoming more electrically sensitive. In the last five years, with the advent of wireless devices, there has been a huge increase in radio frequency exposure from wireless devices, as well as reports of hypersensitivity and diseases related to this exposure. Multiple studies correlate this exposure with diseases such as cancer, neurological disease, reproductive disorders, immune dysfunction, because of the well-documented studies showing adverse effects on health, which I have resources and documentation should you want to see it, The American Academy of Environmental Medicine calls for exercising precaution with regard to these radio frequencies and general frequency exposure. Furthermore, they ask for an immediate caution on smart meter installation due to this potentially harmful exposure. They ask for independent studies to further understand how the health effects from this exposure will affect people. And they want recognition that electromagnetic hypersensitivity is a growing problem worldwide. 
Consumers have not been informed in writing prior to installation of the serious possible health consequences of these meters before installation. Children, pregnant women, the elderly, people with compromised immune systems, and medical implants are most vulnerable, although all populations can suffer dangerous health effects. Upon installation, people report problems of sleeping, headaches, ringing in the ear, heart problems, dizziness, nausea, cognitive problems, and other physical ailments. The following effects have been documented in studies of this type of radiation that's uh, emitted from smart meters. DNA breaks, cancer, endocrine disruptions, birth defects, sterility, heart arrhythmia, learning impairment, and on and on and on. And I'm not making this up. Google smart meters and you'll find enough information to keep you busy for the next month. So how could the government allow smart meters if they're harmful or unsafe? Hello, are you kidding? In the United States, the Federal Communication Commission, the regulatory body with no doctors or medical professionals on staff, has set the guidelines for public RF exposure at very high levels, based on biased and incomplete science dating back to the 1950s. The FCC also appears to have waived some requirements for smart meter manufacturers, allowing them to bend several rules that were intended to protect the public, such as not locating one transmitting meter near another meter. Think of apartment dwellers. All you have to do is look at the bank of meters that service their building to see that this precaution is being violated. Another provision that's ignored is the eight-inch distance that is supposed to be enforced, keeping people from coming closer to that. No smart meter has ever been installed in a way intended to keep people at that minimum distance. What about kids and pets who play around them? So then who does the smart meter benefit? Only the utility companies benefit. The utility can save itself money by getting rid of meter readers. Because the smart meter measures hour by hour, the utility can charge you more for electricity used during certain periods of the day of their choosing. The story is that this device will save you money. The system would allow power prices to vary at different times of the day in keeping up with demand, with a resulting incentive for consumers to run power-hungry appliances like dishwashers and clothes dryers at night when the demand is low. But what if you use an appliance during a time of day that costs more? You will be charged for that entire hour just when your toast pops up or a quick hair dryer use. These meters don't allow you to adjust your usage because your usage data isn't available until as much as 30 days later when you get the bill and when it's too late and your bill is already higher. So what it translates to is that the utility company now has the information to maximize their rate of return by their exclusive access to customer usage data in real time. Now, if your state has an opt-out option whereby you can refuse the new smart meter, some states charge you for that supposedly to pay for the meter reader. Well, I call that double dipping. Aren't we already paying to have our meters read by a live person? Here's some rhetoric directly from the Public Utilities Commission of Ohio's website. They have a question on the website. How do smart meters help customers save electricity and money? They say, quote, smart meters help customers control, reduce, and most importantly, understand their use of electricity. Over time, Electric customers in Ohio will use smart meters and related smart grid technology to control their major appliances and use real-time pricing to adjust their usage behavior, unquote. I say, notice that it does not say that it will save you money. You'll only be able to save money if you take the time to understand and equate your consumption of electricity during cheap times of the day or night. When are these times? How much might you save? Who knows? And do I really need a utility company to help adjust my behavior? Further, they say, quote, Customers will have the option to assist utilities through voluntary load shedding. Utilities will send signals to thermostats and other appliances to adjust the device's activity until another signal is delivered to restore normal activity. Thermostats can be adjusted without being completely turned off, unquote. And I say... Do you really want someone else to have the ability to adjust your thermostat? Really? Will the electric company be able to control customers' electric usage? Here's their quote. 
The purpose of this technology is not to give control of electricity usage to the power company, but rather make customers more informed and allow communication between customers and their utilities, unquote. And I say, let me stop right there. Have you ever tried to communicate with a utility company? Press 1, dial 2, please hold, due to high call volume, please call back later at a less busy time. Back to their website, quote, All too often, people consume electricity without knowing the actual amount they are using and how much they are being charged to use it. Smart Grid works to change this and empowers customers by putting them in control of their usage, unquote. I say, I'm already in control of my usage, and if I want to pay more to run my air conditioner all day, then that should be up to me. So what can you do if you get one of these notices? First, know that utilities have never been granted access to a homeowner's property with an easement to install a transmission station. They were granted access to install an analog mechanical meter only and to read the meter. If your state or area has an opt-out, call now to make your wishes known. If it does not have such an option, advocate for it. Contact your state public utilities, commission, state and local lawmakers, post notices on your property, get involved. Send a certified letter to your utility company that you do not want a smart meter and keep a copy for your files. Your bodily presence on the property is the best protection you can have. You have the right to prevent trespass on your property. Even one renter can ask a trespasser to leave from a building or complex. If the utility worker shows up, ask them nicely to leave because you do not want your meter replaced. If they do not comply, call your local sheriff or police department. Well, the moral of the story is that you should be confident in defying the utility as part of a mass movement of which I am more than happy and ready to spearhead, especially within the state of Ohio, because from what I can tell, there is not an opt-out choice. The utilities fail to seek permission and fail to address concerns. They fail to address other potential hazards that I don't have the time to dwell on today that are out of the realm of healthcare safety, but briefly those would be privacy concerns. Do you really want a device attached to your home that could monitor your activities? Whoops, Mrs. Jones is using too much power today. Oh, Mrs. Jones must be out of town this week. She hasn't used the same amount of power as last week. Every customer's personal usage will be known, harvested, and marketed. Then there's potential skyrocketing electric bills because you don't know when the peaks are and when you should not be using your appliances. The potential to reduce your property value. I know I wouldn't buy a home with a smart meter attached. There goes your property value. Electrical fires due to faulty installation and maintenance. Problems with privacy, hacking, security, electronic interference with other wireless equipment and medical devices. Do these meters play well with pacemakers, oxygen machines? I don't know, and neither will the utility company. They can track your schedule, your habits, your computer usage. The list of potential data collection and subsequent vulnerabilities is almost endless. And are we really at that point where we willingly sacrifice and trade our basic right for privacy for essential services such as heat and lighting? Why would anyone allow this type of known health hazard, privacy intrusion, and personal safety risk? (laughs) And I don't think it's a far stretch at all to consider that the rationing of services is also within the realm of capabilities and just might be a part of the master plan. Big brother, big pharmacy, big utilities, when does it stop? The Fourth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution clearly states the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects. We must honor the Constitution and support our personal decision to opt out of this massive enforced intrusion. It is important to address this issue now to prevent any future encroachment on our individual liberties. As far as I'm concerned, I'm not opting out. I'm refusing to opt in. Join me in this conversation, please. Email me at speak at speakupandstayalive.com or call me 440-725-5462. Now, call me old-fashioned, but to me, being an American and specifically an American consumer means that I have a choice. 
no, I'm not an old hippie looking to find a cause. This came knocking at my door last week in the form of a door hanger thrown on my front porch that heralded the good news. I've been selected. I'm a winner. Oh, yes, I am. Hey, honey, grab the champagne and two glasses. We're heading into battle. Things are seldom what they seem. Skim milk masquerades as cream. Politicians verbalize, but their words are mostly lies. So they be frequently. Listen as I spend the next two minutes with Casey Quinlan. She wrote the book, Cancer for Christmas, Making the Most of a Daunting Gift. Casey, we are going to challenge you today with a little game of sorts where you have to answer the next set of questions with a one or two word answer. When you go for a doctor visit, what is on your must ask list? How much is that? All righty, good. Talking about cost transparency. Next, if you were going to the hospital, what would you pack? Hmm, I would pack my tablet or laptop for the ability to research. All hospitals now have open Wi-Fi. That is an excellent answer. Roger. All right, what is your favorite patient safety word? Why? Excellent, you win. All right, prior to a medical procedure, assuming it's not an emergency, what should we be saying or asking? Why? <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, no. be, channel your three-year-old self talking to your parents. <laughs> Why? <laughs> That's really good. I'm going to use that. Our last one. After you run in with a life-threatening illness, how do you celebrate life? Oh, every day. I'm just glad to be here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, this, uh, I think I should have a tattoo on my forehead. Happy to be here. Oh, I could tell by and your laugh. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to be here. But then I was kind of happy to be here before. Now I'm, I'm happier to be here. Well, we're happy that you're here as well. Give us your website if you would. Well, I have two. I have MightyCasey.com, and I also have Cancer for Christmas, all spelled out, .com. Either one of those will, will give people a way to get in touch with me. So anybody who wants to get in touch with me, trust me, I'm not hiding. It's such a pleasure to have you with us today. You are energizing, and I encourage our listeners to find you online and connect with you, MightyCasey.com. Thank you, and please come back. I will. Thank you. <laughs> You're listening to Speak Up and Stay Alive, Patient Safety Radio. I am your hostess, Pat Rulo, always with a keen eye out for guests who make a difference. Recently, a local hospital sent a mass mailer to my house, and I read about their shared medical appointments. Two days later, while speaking at the Ohio Hospital Association, several attendees mentioned this model to me. So, of course, twice in two days... I had to explore it. My exploration started and ended with our guest today. Might as well go to the top, right? The pioneer of group billable visits is with us today, and might I add a very personable and kind gentleman, Dr. Edward Knopfsinger. Dr. Knopfsinger developed his group visit models when due to his own personal health crisis, he experienced firsthand the shortcomings of our healthcare system. He wanted to develop a care delivery model that would give patients more, not less, and became the foremost expert on group visits. In fact, his experience with and knowledge of group visits is unprecedented. He has designed and implemented group medical visits with more than 500 different providers in primary care, both nationally and internationally, including the local Cleveland Clinic. He was recently selected by HealthSpotter for their prestigious Future Health 100 list of today's top 100 healthcare innovators. So I wasn't kidding around when I arranged our summer just got serious guest lineup. So Dr. Knopfsinger, with great excitement, welcome to our show. Well, thank you very much, Pat. It's a pleasure to be here with you and your listening audience. So thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Well, you and I spoke recently and you shared your most touching personal experience with me that led you to create this model for healthcare delivery. Will you share some of that with our listeners today? Well, I had been a psychologist at Kaiser Permanente in Santa Clara, which is one of the large flagships of the Kaiser line. We have over 
three, even then, over 300,000 patients that are patient members at our one hospital. And I was the director of oncology counseling and chronic illness services since, oh, about 1973 I started there. And so I had worked with thousands of patients with cancer and heart disease and Parkinson's and MS and all, all strokes and all the advanced diseases. And what, was, what happened to me was in between 1988 and 1992, I became very, very seriously ill with a uh, cardiopulmonary health problem that it turned out to be almost uniformly fatal. And my children were four, five, and six years old. And even though I had the best health care you could hope to have, both at Kaiser and I was being seen at UC uh, San Francisco Medical Center, even with the best doctors, I found that it was extremely frustrating to navigate the health care system. The visits, they just seemed too rushed, and it was too hard to get in for an appointment, and the waits were just too long. And I would walk out of an appointment and just say, oh, I forgot to ask this, or I forgot to ask that. And I thought, if only there was just a few more minutes and it was a little more relaxed, I would have asked the question. So I, I started thinking about these shortcomings in our health system, and I thought, well, stop complaining. You know, what, what would you want? If you could redesign health care to be the way you know your patients wanted it and the way you'd like it, what would you do? And I thought, well, first thing I'd do is I'd have prompt access. And I thought, well, how prompt? And I thought, well, any week, a person wanted to be seen for a medical issue, they should be able to be seen. That was point one. And then the second thing was more time. The visits just were getting too rushed. You know, half-hour visits had gone to 20-minute visits, 20-minute visits to 15-minute visits, sometimes 15 minutes down to 10-minute visits. The poor doctor seemed to come in to the exam room to see me running late, looking pressured, and looked worse than I felt, and I felt terrible. And I thought, this system isn't working for them either. They're on this treadmill of care. Somebody keeps tweaking it. The treadmill is going faster and faster and faster. More and more patients, less and less time per patient. And I thought, well, more time. And I, well, how much time did I want? And I thought, well, really, I needed about 90 minutes of visit. And I thought, well, that's not going to work. I laughed then. I still chuckle at the thought, but that's what I thought, 90 minutes. And then the third thing that I wanted is what it made it really work. And that was, I realized that my patients were telling me uniformly, I, I wake up at three in the morning, I can't sleep. I say, why me, God? I feel cheated. I have children. I, I have an uncertain future. What am I going to do if I can't fulfill my normal roles at work and family and socially. And that uncertainty is getting me depressed, anxious, worried. And I thought, I'm having these same feelings. And I thought, you know what? I think I'd like to be with other patients. Other patients could understand. I didn't want to burden my family and friends with my problems, particularly my wife. We had three children, four, five, and six. Her father was dying at the time of metastatic prostate cancer. She had numerous pressures on her. And the last thing she needed was more pressures and worries for me, and I thought, if I could talk with other patients, that would be very helpful. And that's where the concept comes from. So typically, with uh, I called it a drop-in group medical appointment originally, or a digma. And what it means is that any patient that a particular doctor sees is welcome up to a certain number to just drop in and uh, see that doctor at a certain time every day. So let's say that my my internist has an, uh, a digma from 3.30 to 5 on Mondays. Well, I could either call and tell them I'm coming and schedule an appointment so they can prep for me, or I could just uh, drop in and uh, take the chance that the group is actually running that week and be seen for 90 minutes by my own doctor with other patients who may have been dealing with the same health problems that I have but longer and have some helpful tips that will be useful to me. And I found that I really enjoyed these group visits. Once I started getting healthy enough to try them, I started them in 1996, and they're wonderful. And personally, I prefer them to an individual visit. So if I see a doctor, I tell him, you really should start group visits. I would prefer to be seen in that setting myself, as would my family members. Patients usually refer to it as Dr. Welby Care. When we set up a group visit, I always encourage physicians and medical groups to 
make it as patient-friendly as possible, and it's a wonderful choice. And Cleveland Clinic found that uh, well over 80% of the patients who come to a group visit for the first time will choose to schedule a group visit for their following visit, even though they have a whole lifetime of expecting one-on-one visits. Mm -hmm. And it's a lot of fun, with a lot of little extras, too. Things like we serve snacks, healthy snacks that uh, patients enjoy. So it's, it's just it's got a lot of nice touches. Group visits actually promote health that patients help each other, that we get better together, and that it's a, it's a very satisfying modality of care. Right. There's no extra charges. The models that I have, which Cleveland Clinic uses, for example, in Harvard Vanguard and Boston and on and on, they are billed exactly like individual office visits according to the level of care delivered and documented. Good. That's good for our listeners to know so that if they're interested in this type of a visit, that their bill will be the same as if they zipped in and out for 10 minutes. That's right. (laughs) That's right. Well, with all of these folks in the room, what about confidentiality? Confidentiality was one of those things that I felt the success of a group visit would hinge on when I first conceived of the whole idea. And what I found was that if we develop a confidentiality release or confidentiality agreement. Usually it's only a paragraph or two, very simple. And it basically says that I understand that my medical care is going to be delivered in front of other patients today, and that's okay with me. But I also agree that I will not discuss other people's issues or identify them when the group is over. And patients agree to that. And we also point out that if they have anything private they want to discuss, they can just tell the doctor, I have something I'd like to talk to you in private. And the doctor will go ahead and uh, see them in private in the nearby exam room, usually towards the end of the group session. You can still have private one-on-one time with the doctor if you want it. What is surprising is how seldom that's actually requested because the patients get comfortable with one another and pretty soon they're very comfortable talking about uh, almost anything. I I have done groups that talked about such highly personal issues that you would think they wouldn't work. For example, I'm just publishing an article on how I've used group visits and I really encourage others to use group visits to reach out to the poor the disenfranchised, the underserved. And this article will be coming out in the American Medical Group Association's publication, Group Practice Journal. And in that, I talk about one group that I really thought wouldn't work, and that was doing digital rectal exam, prostate exams for elderly hermits living in the bush of Alaska. I really didn't think that that would work. I mean, these are people that are used to being hermits, keeping their issues to themselves, and we're going to do something as private as a digital rectal exam using the physicals model, which is given in private, but then the discussion occurs in the group setting afterwards. And we even had a drop into the group, and one of the men's wives, and one of them, well, the hermits was married to a wife, and she insisted on coming in, and she came in. And I thought, well, certainly now this isn't going to work. But I will tell you, within just a few minutes, the patient who dropped in said, well, like I always said, there's no Niagara without Viagra. <laughs> if we talked about erectile dysfunction, we talked about prostate cancer, we talked about all the types of issues that men are facing dealing with prostate problems later in life. And uh, even the wife was uh, who came in actually was a uh, a plus to the group and added to it nicely. And it ended up being a lot of fun. We had laughter from start to finish. And by the end of the group, every one of these men had their digital rectal exam done. They had a uh, complete uh, update on their uh, health maintenance. They had all the injections they needed, flu shots and so forth. And uh, they walked out uh, with very high levels of patient satisfaction. So sometimes you would think that the issues wouldn't work, but in reality, I've never found that to be the case. Patients open up and pretty soon they're talking with each other like they've known each other for a lifetime. And so issues really aren't a problem. Well, I'm going to think if it works for hermits in the bush in Alaska, it's going to work for just about anyone, right? That's right. I've I've done it. I'll tell you another group. I did it for homeless veterans living living on the streets and the East Coast. And I thought that here was a group of patients that had post-traumatic stress, a lot of mental health issues. A lot of them were extreme abject poverty. Their relationships with people would be one of sheer derogation very often. They're panhandling, whatever. And I thought that a group visit probably would not work for this population. So I flew out and sure enough, 45 minutes before the group, 
group was to start, we sent the wagons out. We sent them out to the flop houses, the soup kitchens, the emergency rooms, and we brought in 15 patients that were homeless, that were veterans, and uh, we provided them with just a wonderful care experience. The only thing is you have to think out what are the challenges going to be with a group like this. And one of the challenges is all the tests you run, you've got to get the results back before the group is over because when the group is over and the patients are back out on the street, that's not a time to find out that their diabetic and their hemoglobin A1C is over 11. We need to deal with it now. So we bound diabetic foot lesions. We dealt with patients that were in the end stages of hepatitis C. The caring and warmth that was shown by these patients and the sheer appreciation that they couldn't believe that the VA or anybody else had taken the time to reach out to them to provide them with a quality healthcare experience the way that we did. I can't tell you how appreciative. I was actually in tears Mm -hmm. on the way back home Mm -hmm. to California. And so I'm absolutely convinced that Patients that are not getting the level of care that they need, that patients that are underserved, the poor, those in poverty, these folks have so much to gain from group visits. And I really hope that group visits are used increasingly to reach out to the poor and underserved. And I hope that's the case. Yeah, I can tell that you've got passion about that. I'm sure once you did one of those visits that that had to be something on your list to make sure it happened. And that's what I was going to ask you, where where you wanted to see this go in the future. And I'm sure that's one direction. Is there anything else? Is there another way you would like to take this? Well, there is. I'm 70 years old now. I keep saying I'm going to retire, but I keep getting hooked into other things that are so exciting and interesting around group visits that I want to do them. For example, in September, I'm going down to Australia and uh, will help them to uh, begin group visits throughout the country. It's going to be a wonderful experience. I'll be presenting at their their lifestyle medicine conference, meeting with doctors all around uh, Australia, and hopefully following up to help them get these developed. And I've, I've done this in Holland. I've done this in Canada. And uh, I look forward to spreading group visits to other countries throughout the world. That's one thing. Another thing that I really would like to do, it would be to join a medical school to present a course on group visits for perhaps two years, training their medical students on on the fine points of how you properly set up and run and do a group visit so that the next generation of doctors learns how to do these. But the real intent would be to develop a curriculum then that would be exportable to medical schools around the world. That's another thing I would like to do. The third thing I would like to do is just expand group visits. People have sort of a narrow view that group visits would be for diabetes or group visits would be good for heart disease or group visits would be good for patients with breast cancer. And they are. They're great for that. The thing is that people do not realize that they are also wonderful in a far broader sense. They have worked in virtually every medical specialty, every surgical specialty, every area of primary care. And what's interesting is there's so much commonality in the issues the patients face, both psychologically and medically, despite the fact their medical diagnoses are quite different. But they still have to, every one of them wants to know, how can I make the best of my life given the limitations that I'm facing? Mm -hmm. How can I live my life as fully as possible. And I'll tell you, the help and support of other patients, a multidisciplinary team, and more face time with your doctor will do a lot to get you on track with having the best life that you can have for yourself given the, the health problems you face. So exciting. There's so much more, I know. But Ed, where can our listeners find out more about you and what you do? Well, I would suggest if they have a real interest, they could go to my website, www.groupvisits.com. That's groupvisits, with an S, dot com. And if they have a physician that they would like me to send some information to, I'd be glad to. On the website, uh, my two books, one of them is Running Group Visits in Your Practice. And the new one this year is the ABCs of Group Visits an implementation manual for your practice. And there's a whole host of videos they could watch as well as references that they can read. Dr. Knopfsinger, you are an inspiration for others to follow. And for me, it's always heartening to learn how some people are able to take a potentially life-threatening experience such as you did and, and turn it around into a way to help others. And you've done just that. So I thank you for sharing yourself and your sensible healthcare model with us today. 
Well, I thank you for having me on. I'd like to leave your listeners with this. And I think back when I was a sick man, and I was told with my diagnosis, what the doctor said was 70% die within two years of onset, and nobody's lived seven years. And that was mm-hmm. my diagnosis. And, and I look back and I think, how could something so bad turn into something so good as group visits? And I just feel... That the good man upstairs had a lot to do with this. He had a job for me to do, a job that I willingly did, and I have to say it's been the most exciting part of my life. And I just hope that everybody has that sense of inspiration from within, that they have something that makes their life worthwhile and something that they can do that will make this world just a little better place. Because when our time eventually comes, none of us are leaving with baggage in hand, taking our worldly goods with us. But what we can do as we lay there and we reflect on our life is to say, you know what, I think that I might have left this world just a little bit better than I found it. And that satisfaction, I hope everybody and every one of your listeners has. You are a special man. I am so happy that I met you and I'm so pleased to be able to share you with our listening audience. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Pat, and take care. someone you know have a complicated medical situation? What about a hospital insurance or billing problem? Need help with a health care appeal? Or do you just need someone who can coordinate your care? Listen as I spend the next two minutes with Hari Khalsa, better known as the health care whisperer. She always has the answers. Hari, tell us, our medical records, how can we access them and do we have the right to do that? I tell people that you got to have your medical records. It's so important to know what's being written because there can be mistakes in your medical records. It's actually very simple to access your medical records. The first thing to do is you can either call them, you can visit them in person, or you can send them a fax. What you need is the form. Each department has a form to release your medical records. Fill that out, hand it in, and they should, by law, get it to you within 30 days. If you get any trouble, if anybody says, no, we're not giving you your your medical records, no, not today, I always tell people, ask for a supervisor because it is your right to have a copy of your medical records. Now, it's important to know that most places do charge you for it. So be prepared to know exactly what you want. If you've been in the hospital a lot, your medical record is going to be very large and you're probably going to have to pay money. Although I've been able to negotiate that down. But a lot of times it can cost $100 to get a full record. So know exactly what it is you want. Do you want your labs? Do you want the copies of the x-rays or just the doctor's notes? So tell them exactly what you want and know that it's your right to get them. Right. I think that's the key. Just knowing that you do have the right to those medical records and not to leave until you do speak with someone or you do get a copy of them. Excellent information, Hari. How can our listeners find out more about you and where can they contact you? Well, they can go to my website at healthcarewhisperer.com. They can contact me at 866-980-4325 or on Twitter at HariK108. Well, great. Thank you, Hari, for sharing your wisdom with us today. And And we look forward to your return next week. Oh, great. I look forward to it. Thank you so much. Thank you. And remember to visit Hari at healthcarewhisperer.com. I'm Jerry the Germ with a Speak Up and Stay Alive Healthcare and Hospital Safety Snippet just for you. Here's our expert, Pat Rulo. Hey, Jerry, did you know that people are talking dirty and don't even know it? Think of cell phones and office telephones. A lot of respiratory viruses are expelled when you talk, sneeze, or cough. Thousands of people each year miss time from work. Thanks to all this dirty talk, staying safe is easy. Learn how to keep a clean and germ-free workplace. And Jerry, what are you doing on the bottom of that lady's purse? Stay safe. Listen to Speak Up and Stay Alive Radio every Sunday morning from 9 to 10 on KKNT AM 960 The Patriot. For more information, visit speakupandstayalive.com. Brought to you by Mountain View Funeral Home and Cemetery on East Main Street in Mesa and Santan Mountain View Funeral Home and Advanced Planning Center on South Ellsworth Road in Quinn Creek. They're family owned and operated and have served the East Valley for over 61 years. Visit them online at Mountain View Funeral Home and Cemetery.com or call 480 832 2850. 
You're listening to Speak Up and Stay Alive, Patient Safety Radio. Listen to us live, online, from anywhere in the world at the station's websites. I am your hostess, Pat Rulo. So happy to spend this hour with you to help you survive any healthcare or hospital encounter. It's time for our favorite program, right? What's that? Fear the Wheelchair. Oh my gosh, Joe's always so excited to play. By now you've heard me talk about how I fear the wheelchairs that grace the front doors of almost every hospital. Patients and visitors get out of their cars and hop into the wheelchair and I always wonder, where have they been? What have they touched? Then they wheel around the hospital and use the bathroom, sit in waiting rooms, visit patients, all the while picking up additional and deadly hospital bacteria like MRSA, C. diff, a bit of E. coli, and perhaps some candida yeast. And at the end of the day, they're back in their car, leaving the contaminated wheelchair at the front door of the hospital, ready for the next patient to climb aboard. This makes the wheelchair a high-touch, highly contaminated vehicle capable of spreading infections all over the place. So the wheelchair is now this show's representation of all hospital dangers, kind of like our mascot. So here we go with our new favorite. Well, it's not new anymore, but it's but it's our favorite game. <laughs> yes, it is. It is. And what is it, Joe? Fear the wheelchair. Well, let's listen as Joe reads some right or wrong statements. And then even though I can't hear you, shout out your answer along with Bob. Is the statement right or is it wrong? All right, Joe. All right, here we go. Right or wrong. Here's a restroomology question. Bathroom stalls on the right side are cleaner than the stalls located on the left. What's the, what do you think about that, Bob? I think about it. Maybe it's right. Oh, no. That is wrong. Bob, most people are right-handed and tend to gravitate to the right-handed stalls. So if you enter an, a restroom and that has stalls on the left and the right, which one are you going to choose? Left. Yes, that's important stuff, Bob. Right or wrong, if you're going to the hospital for any type of surgery, ask to be tested for MRSA. What do you think, Bobby? That is definitely right. Yes, that is right. Anyone who is considered an at-risk patient should request a nasal MRSA screening. Right or wrong, when researching symptoms on the Internet, believe everything you read. If it's in writing, then it must be true. Mm, what do you think, Bob? Well, that's wrong. <laughs> yes, that's obviously wrong. But you know what? You'd be surprised how many folks tend to think that way. Research several different sites. Check to see who's funding the site. Make sure they're simply not in the business to sell wonder drugs or overnight cures. The bottom line, be a detective. Uncover every source that you can. Compare and check with your health care provider. All right, right or wrong, if you don't see any bleach wipes in your hospital room, just dust your bed tray with a napkin or paper towel. Oh, what do you think, Bob? <laughs> That's definitely wrong. <laughs> of course that's wrong. Ask the hospital staff for a canister of bleach wipes. Put on a pair of gloves and clean every high-touch item in your room using one bleach wipe per surface. I do this several times each day just as a precaution. Right or wrong, 40% of tray tables on the airplanes are contaminated with MRSA. Mm, what do you think, Bob? Uh, that's a little high. Maybe that's wrong. Ooh, sadly, that statement is right. Here's what I do whenever I fly. I bring a baggie of bleach wipes and I wipe down the seat and the seat belt and the tray tapes. With turnaround times as fast as they are, nothing is cleaned, let alone sanitized. And what's interesting is the person sitting next to me or across from me always asks to borrow some of my wipes. Oh, bring hand sanitizer. You think I should bring that as well. Do you remember that time that... Uh, well, I guess the cabin pressure pressurized my bottle of hand sanitizer, and when I opened the lid, the gel squirted all over the pants on the guy next to me. It was, it was sort of embarrassing. <laughs> it was crazy. <laughs> any more, Joe? Yeah, that was the last one. Right or wrong, only wealthy people should pursue any kind of estate planning. Mm, how about that, Bob? Oh, that's wrong. Yes, that is very wrong. And I challenge everyone listening today to get their financial and health care affairs in order. Power of attorney, living wills, last wills and testaments. You'll be glad you did. Well, remember, the more you know, the safer you'll be. And you heard about it here on Speak Up and Stay Alive Radio. Well, thanks, guys, once again for playing everybody's favorite game. Fear the wheelchair. You are listening to Speak Up and Stay Alive Radio. I am Pat Rulo, where the boys and I are keeping you safe during any healthcare or hospital encounter.
Once again, we have my friend Elizabeth Bailey with us, and she is ready to share some valuable patient safety checklists with us found in her book, The Patient's Checklist. Listen as Elizabeth spends the next two minutes with us to share some of her easy-to-use checklist tips and tools. Elizabeth, tell us today, what are some things a patient should bring for a hospital stay? Here are a few simple things that oftentimes people don't think about. Hospitals are very, very noisy places, and sometimes it's really difficult simply to just get some rest, and sleep is essential for healing. So I suggest patients bring earplugs and a sleep mask. Hospitals are also often very cold. So I always suggest bring some extra socks so your feet don't get cold. Circulation is is a is a really important part of the healing process as well. One of the most important things I think people can bring is an economy size hand sanitizer. And that should be placed on the bedside table because patients should be washing their hands as much as your family and healthcare personnel who are dealing with you. Having a hand sanitizer on the table right next to the patient is a reminder for everyone that hand hygiene is crucial. And finally, I would suggest bringing a family photo that reminds you of life outside the hospital and reminds you that you are a person first and a patient second. Oh, that's great advice. I love the hand sanitizer idea to bring a giant one, place it on the table. Everyone can, they can't miss it. The photo idea is an excellent idea as well. Tell our listeners how they can learn more about you and where they can purchase your book. My book is on Amazon, but you can find out more about my book and me by going to my website, thepatientschecklist.com. Well, Elizabeth, I thank you for sharing your wisdom and advice with us today. You and I have had similar paths, and I am happy that those paths have crossed. And you're a welcome addition to our show, and I look forward to more of your tips next week. Thank you very much for having me. On this show, we talk about the need for a patient advocate during every healthcare or hospital encounter. But advocacy also includes whom you rely on when it comes to health insurance. Listen while I spend the next two minutes with Chris Alberta, the Medicare supplement partner with Generation America, as we discuss the importance of choice. Chris, at what age should a person begin to seek out this information, and when can they enroll in a Medicare supplement plan? Yeah, good question. The majority of people, about 64 and a half, their mailbox just gets filled to the brim with stuff from every carrier and every product on the planet. Now, Medicare does something unique. They offer what's called the open enrollment period which is different than the annual period that comes around each November, December. And during that open enrollment period, a person can choose any supplemental plan they want. And regardless of their health conditions or pre-existing problems, they can choose whatever plan and go right on it and get the best rate. You only get that open enrollment period, Pat, one time. So really at 64 and a half, you got to start looking. By 65, you should be enrolled in something. So it's really, really cool to say to people, look, I know you got a mailbox full of stuff. They all say they're the best. Really, the best one for you is the one that costs the least. Anybody can grab you with a low price right off the bat, but you don't want to be doing this process every six months. That is great advice. So rather than sifting through all that mail when you're 64 and a half, our listeners can purchase the proper Medicare supplement for their unique situation through Generation America. How can our folks do that? Well, the website generationamerica.org is is the main portal. That's the front door really for that team. Well, thank you for spending the time to clarify Medicare supplements with us today, Chris. No problem, Pat. Thanks for having me. It's a really great opportunity. For more information or to join, visit GenerationAmerica.org. You're listening to Speak Up and Stay Alive, Patient Safety Radio, every Saturday morning in Cleveland, Ohio, and every Saturday and Sunday morning in Phoenix, Arizona. I am Pat Rulo, your hostess and author of the book, Speak Up and Stay Alive, The Patient Advocate Hospital Survival Guide, available at all of our live speaking events or at our website, speakupandstayalive.com. That's where you can also locate radio showtimes, dates, and station information. That's speakupandstayalive.com. And if you want to purchase the book but do not have Internet access, it's okay to call me. Lots of folks order the book by phone, so give me a call, 440-725-5462.
Well, today we talked about the not-so-smart meters. Please, don't be duped by the name SMART, just like the name Affordable Care Act. My insurance premiums just jumped $100 a month. How is that affordable? Just like the door hanger thrown on my doorstep that touts good news. Remember, things are seldom what they seem. Just because they have great fancy adjectives doesn't make it true. Do your research and please contact me with your smart meter experience, questions, concerns, or comments. I am willing to take some responsibility to prevent this invasion on our health, our privacy, and our well-being. And our guest, Dr. Edward Nofsinger, I so enjoyed talking with him, and I believe that his group medical appointments are the way of the present and the future, allowing patients to help patients and offering a team-based approach as a way to free the doctor's time to actually deliver high-quality care. Be sure to visit his website, groupvisits.com. Now, if you missed some of today's radio show and you want to hear it in its entirety, it's easy. Simply go to the radio link at the website, speakupandstayalive.com. Start your week with an O, Speak Up and Stay Alive Radio. Oh, and be sure to listen next week as our Summer Just Got Serious guest lineup continues. We will have E-Patient Dave, another fine man on the edge of dying, who made a comeback and now advocates for patients everywhere as an internationally recognized speaker and activist. You may not be familiar with some of these folks, but our summer guests are hotter than a red Savina habanero chili, which, by the way, is 65 times hotter than the habanero. So call your friends, your neighbors, your in-laws, and even your outlaws, and tell them to cancel all plans. Mark your calendar, crank up the AC, unless, of course, you have a smart meter, and set your alarms for when? You know when? Saturday mornings in Phoenix, Arizona, from 6 to 7 Mountain Time on AM 1360 KPXQ. And then on Sunday morning in Phoenix, you can listen from 9 to 10 Mountain Time on AM 960 KKNT, or listen live via the internet from anywhere in the world. It's easy. Check the website, speakupandstayalive.com, to find out how. In the meantime, I hope you have a healthy and a happy week. I am Pat Rulo, and I am your guide to safe and successful health care and hospital encounters. The information provided in today's broadcast is for informational purposes only and was not intended for use as diagnosis or treatment of a health problem and should not be considered as medical advice. If you've missed part of today's show or just want to share the information with friends, you can listen to all of Pat's previous shows at speakupandstayalive.com. Want even more information? Purchase a copy of Pat's book at speakupandstayalive.com. Once again, it's speakupandstayalive.com. Or you can call Pat at... 440-725-5462. Until next week, remember, it's okay to ask others to wash their hands. You have to speak up and stay alive. Generation America supports Speak Up and Stay Alive Radio. Generation America, the smart, conservative, and traditional 50-plus membership organization. Generation America cares what their members think about the issues affecting seniors and ensure their voices are heard. And they provide a full range of benefits to members. If you're looking for quality Medicare supplement, their rates are lower than the other 50-plus organization three out of four times. Generation America, on the right side for seniors. To join and to find out more, visit GenerationAmerica.org. 